Welcome to Godsplaining, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. And welcome back to Godsplaining. I am Father Gregory Pine. I don't know why. Sometimes when I introduce myself, it's like, now I'm going to tell you something that you don't know. But you do. So why I communicate it with the same level of excitement every time is entirely beyond me. So now, on to more exciting things. Um, I'm here with Father Jacob Bertrand. Father Jacob Bertrand, how you doing? I'm, I'm suffering right now, honestly. <laughs> if, uh, if you were to, to go onto the YouTubes to watch the video, you would see that I am absolutely blinded by the light that's coming in from the window. Um, I was told that it looks great, but I, I'm hurting right now. So, but other than that, <laughs> things are good. So it's great to be here for sure. Yeah. So um, on future episodes, you might be able to, you know, tune in and find that we're wearing sunglasses or that we have like elaborate sun reflection contraptions. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And by elaborate reflection contraptions, I mean like cardboard boxes held above our eyes. I was looking uh, for cardboard to block out that part of the window. And people might wonder, just for the record, for, for so that I don't seem like a total moron, the blinds are closed, but at the House of Studies, there are these like panel stained glass above the blinds that don't have blinds. And I have an office that gets sun 24 seven in my face. So good. A lot of vitamin D, which is good, but otherwise it's tough. So. <laughs> Uh, and I live in Switzerland, so my room is surrounded by mountains, and I'm currently sitting in three feet of snow, so I have no sun problems. Um, but now, here we are. When you clicked on this episode, you said, I am prepared to listen to a guest. To this moment in the show, you have not yet met the guest, but it is my pleasure to introduce one Karin Oberg, uh, who is a professor of astrochemistry at Harvard. So Karin, we're delighted to have you on the show. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to report that I have this soft grayish light streaming in through the windows, <laughs> providing perfect lighting and no problem at all with blinding sunshine. Naturally. No, that, that works perfectly because if anyone tunes into the video portion of the podcast, they should be used to our awful video quality. That's getting better. Thanks to our donors. We're, babe, we're It's getting better, but you look great. We look terrible. That's how it should be. <laughs> Um, so Karin, would you go ahead and just maybe just give a little introduction and tell our listeners where you're from, what you do, how you came to do it, just a, a basic sketch. Sure. So my current profession uh, is that I'm a professor of astronomy at, at Harvard. Uh, so I, I teach astronomy courses. I also advise and supervise a PhD thesis uh, in, in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, so how I came to be here uh, started out in Sweden, which is where I'm originally from. Uh, and then through a range of circumstances or maybe rather more providential uh, uh, <laughs> care, I ended up first on the West Coast uh, in college. And uh, there I figured out that I really wanted to do astronomy. So that got me started towards my thesis work and uh, which I did in Europe. But back in Europe, I really missed the US. So I knew I was, I was going to come back here uh, as quickly as possible for to continue my career in academia. And luckily, uh, Harvard wanted me. So uh, as of 2013, I have been on the on the faculty in the astronomy department uh, here uh, in Cambridge. Okay, let's um. I know, well, I was about to say nothing about science. I know less than nothing about science. <clears throat> uh, doesn't keep me from, like, saying that I know things about science. Um, but, I, you know, you hear sometimes scientists describe uh, their calling, as it were, to pursue whatever it might be, biology or chemistry or physics or something like that, uh, as if it were a kind of, like, vocation. And I think that, you know, we, we use that language um, for you. Uh, the discovery of science was it was it that type of thing was it like well i've got to pay the bills somehow i can either sell vacuum cleaners or i can be a scientist you know try the vacuum cleaner thing science seems better or was it something to which you felt like wow this is it this is what i want to do I'm glad i'm here uh the latter eventually but it's a, a bit of a roundabout way that i got there so so I come from a family that's pretty scientifically minded so i think i was indoctrinated in towards that a career in science was a, you know, maybe preferential path to follow from a very young age, maybe five or six uh, or so. 
but as a teenager, I definitely explored other interests. I've always, re always enjoyed reading and history uh, a lot. So I was for a while thinking about maybe something more towards uh, the arts uh, or uh, something a little bit, I guess, more practical than science. But I also figured out uh, sometime in, in high school um, that I was good at uh, the sciences and mathematics and especially at chemistry. Uh, and around the same time, I figured out that I wanted to, uh, to leave, uh, like to basically go on an adventure for, a, for college, uh, to go as, almost as far uh, away as possible from my hometown. Uh, and um, my father encouraged me in the sense that he told me that there was this school on the West Coast in the US called Caltech that there was no way I would ever get admitted to. So of course, when I spent <laughs> the next few years uh, trying to figure out how I could possibly get admitted uh, to this place, which, which I was. Uh, and arriving there, um, I it started out fine, like I continued to feel like I was good at chemistry, um, but I also started to realize more and more that the questions in the sciences that I was the most attracted to were the ones that have some sort of overlap with some of the big philosophical questions, you know, the, the origins of the cosmos, the origins of life, you know, where do we come from kind of questions. And they seemed to be more situated in physics rather than, than chemistry. Unfortunately, around the same time as I realized that this was what I was really attracted to, I also realized that I wasn't that good at physics. <laughs> so this, this was a problem. Um, so I, I was put in this very unhappy situation. Do I choose what I'm good at, which was chemistry, or do I try to pursue the things that uh, really interest me, which were these, what I thought, big questions situated in physics? Uh, I am pretty practical, so I ended up choosing chemistry. Uh, also, I don't like feeling like I'm bad at things, so that also helped. Uh, but I was a little bit depressed uh, about having to had to make that choice, and I definitely didn't feel that vocation for chemistry that you were you were talking about. But then during my sophomore year, um, I was introduced to a field that's called astrochemistry. So this is basically applying the science of chemistry to answer astronomical or astrophysical uh, questions. And that from then on, I just, I mean, that's, that's a gift, right? Suddenly I can actually go and pursue the questions that I really wanted to, but I could do it with what I was actually good at. Uh, so from that on, I have never looked back. From that on, it was just very clear to me that this is what I was supposed to do. And I have no regrets whatsoever. So I, I still feel that that is what I'm supposed to be doing. That's great. Yeah. So you, asking big questions, um, big questions about life, origins of life. I don't know. Maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. I hope that I'm not. But uh, it's just my natural or a way to segue kind of naturally <laughs> into the next question that I'm going to ask you. Um, so you're Catholic, but you weren't always Catholic. Um, was it the asking those questions that began sort of the process of conversion to the faith? Um, I guess, tell us about, about that part of your life coming to, coming to the church, your conversion, um, maybe had nothing to do with those questions. Uh, but, uh, you'll tell us, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, your face is really bright now. Uh, <laughs> I can lean back. If there you haven't go. noticed. I have, time. I just keep looking at it angrily. So... <laughs> So directly, it had little, very little to do with it. I think indirectly, um, maybe more. But I guess the easiest way to let you judge is to actually, actually tell the story. So the background is that, as, as I said, I'm from Sweden. I grew up in a pretty typical Swedish family, at least in the sense of its, um, how religious it was, or rather how religious it wasn't. So I, I was baptized in the in the Church of Sweden, which is a Lutheran church, but was never really in a context where I was practicing uh, my faith. And by the time I was a teenager, I had slipped into some some sort of uneasy uh, agnosticism, I would say. And the reason that it was uneasy was that I continued to be very interested in history and related subjects in philosophy and, and just in sort of reading great uh, great books. 
And there were two things that for me never really gelled with a purely materialistic worldview. Uh, one was a very strong, um, I guess, sense of that I had a will and could make choices. I think most people actually have the same experience that, that they have, ha have a will and that their choices matter. Uh, but being sort of philosophically and what I think also scientifically minded, it disturbed me that that didn't seem to gel very well with the worldview that I was surrounded by. And the other one was that I was starting to develop a very strong sense for that there are, um, that morals are real, that there are some, even though we can't always know what's right or wrong, there are some things that are right there are, or good and there are some things that are evil. and. Uh, if you have something that's truly good or truly evil, you are measuring it against something that is not just your own subjectivity. So these two things kept haunting me uh, for many years. But the tipping point uh, came uh, after I just uh, finished college uh, and moved uh, to Europe, to Leiden in the Netherlands, to start my, my thesis work. And I read a series of books uh, by C.S. Lewis. And the final book that I read uh, was, uh, well, not the, I guess, final, but the third and most important book that I read was Mere Christianity. Mm. And it was a very, very disturbing day that I read Mere Christianity because I started the day as an agnostic and sort of halfway through the day, I realized that I was a Christian. And uh, that was That's disturbing. a big jump. <laughs> that yeah. was a big jump. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really have any Christian friends or any sort of community. So I didn't really know what you're supposed to do. And I think it actually took me years before I started to pray. But the one thing I knew is that you're supposed to go to church on Sundays. So that was the one thing I started <laughs> the following week and ended up uh, doing uh, going to an Anglican church in the Netherlands uh, for the rest of my thesis work. Okay. Got it. Who, so reading C.S. Lewis, did you just pick him up? Was he given to you? How, how did you come across that? Book, book number one was given to me and okay. I, I enjoyed it. And I had read Narnia when I was uh, younger. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so book number one was given to me and that was the screw type letters, uh, which I enjoyed. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then book number two, which I bought myself was the abolition of man. And that one was a really important step because I think in that one, C.S. Lewis actually crystallizes this sort of uneasiness that I already had about what I thought was the consequences, consequences of a materialistic worldview versus uh, my very strong view about moral uh, realism. Uh, and then the third book, uh, I then ended up also buying myself, which was Mere Christianity. Got it. So ended in, well, not ended, but at least that point ended in an Anglican uh, worship, going to Anglican Sunday uh, liturgies. Where where does uh, the Catholic Church come in? Well, so the Catholic Church, um, let's see. So there, I think there are multiple steps on the way. And just to back up uh, a little bit, because I think I actually had had an affinity for the Catholic Church for a long time. Uh, so the very first book, uh, the first real book that I read, which, and which is still my one of my absolute favorite books, was The Lord of the Rings. And I think actually from a very young age, in some sense, was um, quietly uh, indoctrinated to having a very favorable, favorable view of the Catholic Church. I just remember even as a teenager, you know, my agnostic years, that I just had a very sort of I was being, whenever there was a Catholic priest that was part of some old Hollywood movie, like I just felt very <laughs> positive <laughs> towards that. So, so I think that I had that in the background that had been going on for a long time. Uh, but then after about a year after my sort of first conversion into the, into Christianity, uh, one of my brothers uh, who is uh, not a Christian himself, uh, thought that if I was actually going to persist in this whole Christianity thing, that I should I should do it a bit better, uh, and he gave me <laughs> J.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy uh, okay. to read. So that that was my sort of more clearer gateway uh, into into the Catholic Church, and I still still love that book. As do I. Uh, although when people ask like whether or not I recommend it, I sometimes say maybe. <laughs> 
because I think as many people as are wowed by it, an equal number of people are entirely confused. They're like, why doesn't he just say what he wants to say? Why does he instead say a thousand things to set up like one cute pun? It's like, listen, it's a really, really good pun. Um, so with that, we're going to go to our break. Hear a word from our sponsors. Spoilers, our sponsors are ourselves. And we'll catch you back on the other side of it on God's Plenty. You are listening to God's Planning. Visit us at godsplaining.org to listen to our episodes, shop our store, and donate to our podcast. All gifts go to improving the podcast and bringing the gospel to more listeners. Thanks for your support. And welcome back to God's Planning. If you are listening at this point in the show, you either skipped the first 15 minutes because you just couldn't bear the thought of listening to a 30-minute episode, or you are already familiar a bit with the story of one, uh, Professor Karin Oberg, professor of astrochemistry at Harvard University, uh, who's just been telling us a bit of her own kind of coming into uh, scientific research and profession and into the Catholic faith. So at this point, We've read G.K. Chesterton's Orthodoxy. We're wending our way towards Catholicism. Now, for the next stage, um, let's bring it up to let's bring it up to the point where you started meeting uh, Dominicans. Not necessarily that all good stories have to end in such a way. I would say that some good stories end in that way. Almost um, none. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky. Savage. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, usually they end in like woe, woe, woefare, woefare. That's a, co a combination of woe and warfare. Or yeah, yep. Yeah. Moving That's on. It's just sad wars, sad <laughs> losing with Dominicans. <laughs> woefare. That's right. Yeah, it's like Chesterton said about the Irish. What's it? All their wars are merry, and all their songs are sad. It's the opposite of that with Dominicans. Everything is sad, and that's not the opposite. That's just never mind. Okay, so um, you know a few Dominicans. You've come across a few Dominicans and have come to be involved in the work of the Thomistic Institute. So how did that come about? Yeah, so it's it started very shortly after uh, officially, formally entering into full communion with the Catholic Church, uh, which happened uh, here in, in Cambridge. Uh, but it happened right before I got uh, started my first faculty position, which was at University of Virginia, uh, which has a very nice uh min student ministry or campus ministry that's run by dominicans uh so so i had i had entered a church i had still actually didn't really know other catholics so my first catholic community was the dominican-led community uh, at the university of virginia uh, which was a very beautiful and very important sort of part of formation for me to go through uh, but as a part of that and I, I just really connected very well with a couple of the friars there uh, around that time, I also found out that uh, one of my friends from my Caltech years, uh, Father Thomas Davenport, uh, had entered the order. And uh, so we reconnected after not having seen each other for, for a decade. And uh, so that was, so was a, those are already two points of connection. And then the third one happened in New York about a, a year or so later when I was there visiting a friend. And he knew that I already had this affection for the order. So when he wanted to convince me to to stay a little bit longer to basically hang out with him and his friends, uh, he told me that there was going to be a talk by a Dominican friar uh, the next day. So if I only stayed for another day, I could go and go to this talk. And <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed. I rebooked my, my train ticket um, and, and stayed for, for another day. And that turned out to be a talk by Father Dominic Clegg, uh, and this was at the beginning of the of the Thomistic Institute. So there weren't yet that many sort of different campus uh, uh, TI sort of chapters uh, set up. So I got to know uh, Father Dominic, and a few months later, I random, well, random is maybe uh, the, the wrong wrong word, but I ran into Father Thomas Joseph uh, at another event in New York when I was visiting. So I had about sort of a year or so into my position, faculty position here at Harvard, I had at least four different connections in, in, into the order. And uh, at that point, I guess I, I was stuck. So I have, I have stuck, been working yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. with, especially with the Thomistic Institute ever since. Yeah. For, for Thomistic Institute things, um, and part of, the, part of the excitement, I guess, of this episode is um, that there is a new 
TI venture that you're involved with. Uh, so the TI has been putting out videos about, I suppose, TI. Not all of our no- listeners necessarily know what the TI is. Um, uh, the TI stands for Thomistic Institute, which we've mentioned to this point. Uh, you know, you repeat things so as to reaffirm them. Uh, and I guess it was, well, maybe like a year and a half ago, the Thomistic Institute started releasing videos like twice a week, once a week, depending uh, about the theology or philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. And then the most recent series was about virtue, which led up seamlessly into the present series, which you are now a part of, which is about faith and science. So could you just tell us a little bit about that project? Um, Why faith and science? Why not, you know, like faith and Edward Hopper paintings or like faith and stucco or like, you know, faith and shoe polish? Why are like faith and science especially well suited to be in a Thomistic Institute video series? Okay, so I will answer that. Um, but before, I, I guess I just want to say that I love the Aquinas 101 videos and I've seen every single one of them. And if there's any of the listeners that have not done so, uh, <laughs> they should take some time this weekend and uh, and try to get through as many as they as they can. They're awesome. So um, so when I was asked whether I wanted to to be part of the series, I was I was very happy uh, to do so, and. I guess part of why I'm part of a faith in science rather than a faith in stucco uh, series is that I actually don't know anything about stucco, <laughs> so that <laughs> would be very appropriate. Uh, but if I were to try to, to guess why the Thomistic Institute would want to make a faith in science series, and also why I'm happy, why I'm excited about it, I think it is. Because scientific knowledge uh, in, in the society we live in is sort of at the pedestal compared to other kinds or like ways of attaining uh, truth. And um, that's not necessarily fair, uh, but I think that is, that is a fact like of, of the society we live in that people often even equate truth with scientific truth or uh, no, scientific knowledge and knowledge. And so, and also there is, I think, a very widely held misconceptions that there are scientific truths that disprove uh, philosophical or theological truths. And if you then have already said that science is the best kind of truth, maybe the only kind of truth, and is sort of disproving uh, religious ones, well, that can be a real barrier uh, for people of faith or for people who are considering, uh, you know, uh, joining the church or uh, just uh, growing in their faith life. So I see it mostly uh, as a way to remove barriers towards the faith. But I also think it's very good for people of faith to be scientifically literate. So I'm hoping it's also going to help people who maybe aren't themselves uh, disturbed by this proposed conflict between science and religion to just get a bit better understanding about what science can uh, and cannot do and feel more confident in taking some of those discussions with other people. I imagine at um, at Harvard, at a obviously an extremely prestigious institution and also teaching astrochemistry, something that probably most people like don't even know how to spell, um, like the, <laughs> the prestige of that and, and the intellects in, in those worlds, I imagine are pretty astounding. Have you, I, I guess, the, I, I think I know the answer to this, but what is it like, um, what is the environment like there with your colleagues, with students, with doctoral candidates, with with respect to the, like a faith and science world? Is, I, I, is, it, is it such that they don't even interact do they interact in some ways are they is there hostility not so much at harvard but just in generally in in this kind of world that you think and live and operate in i've had a great experience at harvard it's been a thoroughly positive one and i've been very open about my faith and my commitment to the catholic church uh, from before i was hired Uh, and uh, i've just been i think surprised in some sense, both how easy it has been and how much joy I've had from uh, living out my faith uh, at a place like like Harvard. I mean, most of my colleagues, I think, um, don't actually really care. <laughs> the, the, it's, uh, I think many of them would see this as a, as kind of a hobby, uh, but it's they don't see it as one that's threatening uh, in, in any way. Mm. Uh, but many of them actually see it as an asset. Uh, we do have students of faith, both who are in our programs and who are we try to recruit. 
uh, it's uh, in that sense I I serve some sort of diversity uh, <laughs> uh, requirement for the department. So it's um, I've it's been used as as kind of a recruitment tool that they know they have a mentor. Uh, so I tend to mentor not just Catholic students, but also some other Christian students, uh, Jewish, Muslim, uh, that uh, just want to have another sort of person, especially a faculty uh, of faith, to talk to, to talk to and talk through some of these these questions with. So, so I've had a really good experience. So I guess maybe maybe one stumbling block that I have heard exists, uh, maybe have encountered a bit, is that. Um, a uh, scientific ex explanation, uh, when done well, right, kind of stays within its competence. But when done poorly by scientists who are also armchair philosophers, it can it can make it sound like there really there really isn't any room um, for faith in these types of discussions. Like it's a it's a hypothesis for which many scientists have no need. So what do you do like when it comes to methodology wise? Because you're not you know you're not you're not there to um uh whatever like teach sacred doctrine in your astrochemistry class you're called to you know teach to teach your particular discipline um but but are there particular ways that you go about it methodologically that you think are informed by your faith or that um that cause other people to ask you questions about your faith good ways that you're kind of you know innocent as a dove but crafty as a serpent uh so i don't think that there's any of my methods um sort of narrowly defined that is affected by by my faith. Uh, I think it does, um, there, there are a couple of different ways to answer that. I would say the first thing is that I do try to be visibly Catholic. So I, especially when teaching undergrads, I do typically uh, wear a crucifix, uh, which uh, has been seen and it's, I mean, this is what I hope to do, is seen as an invitation for students to reach out after class uh, if they want to talk uh, about uh, about things that pertain to science and religion or just, you know, other, other question that has to do with their faith life. So that, that's been really powerful. And there's a lot of, I had a lot of good experiences coming out of that. Um, I do teach a seminar series for freshmen on science and religion. So, so there, uh, you know, some of these questions are, I mean, I still try to take, you know, an academic approach to it. I don't assume that people are coming there because they are seekers in their faith life, but just they're curious about sort of the intellectual aspects of um, debates between science and religion. And, and that's been lots of fun. I do have them read some of the proofs of St. Thomas Aquinas. And it okay. is actually one of the things, it, it generally shocks at least half the class to realize that he is really logical. Uh, that's one of the most common comments I get. <laughs> it is, it's really rational. <laughs> uh, and so that doesn't mean they're convinced, uh, but they can sort of see that this is actually a hyper rational in some sense person like going through step by step uh, an argument. Uh, I think in the more sort of scientific enterprise, uh, the main effect it has had on that is that it has uh, pushed me to reframe how I think about um, how to do science, which is sort of a human project and how to prioritize sort of the development, the development and needs of my students and more junior collaborators um, over sort of short-term gains uh, towards uh, obtaining scientific truths. Uh, so I think I am sort of naturally very competitive and I definitely want the honors and the awards and all that. And I think my Catholic faith has helped, <laughs> probably not fixed, but helped to um, round up off some of the roughest edges there and sort of keep me keep me more focused on on the things that actually matter. Well, Karin, this has been great, uh, and I'm sure our listeners will very much you know enjoy and be heartened by your description of you know you're coming to the faith and um, you're navigating difficulties of you know the 21st century, but the 21st century in a particular scientific setting. Um, maybe just for a last thing, if you could just tell, tell our listeners where they can find the Thomistic Institute science and faith series or where they might, yeah, look for more resources, things that you're doing, things that you have available for them to, to inquire into further. Yeah, I wish, uh, I knew the exact like web location, but if you Google, <laughs> 
Aquinas 101, science and faith. It is the first thing that comes up. I have nice. tried that. So that, that okay. would be my, my advice. But also if you just go to, I mean, I guess you are on YouTube, maybe. If you, are, if you aren't on YouTube, you can go to YouTube. <laughs> and uh, again, just search for Aquinas 101, faith and science. It is the first thing that, that will come up. And the first couple of episodes are already out. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, I saw... I saw the preview and I saw one by Father James and then I saw, I guess, one by Father Dominic. So there will be videos from you coming out shortly, no doubt. Um, and I know that Father Jacob Bertrand has a couple of announcements as well. Yeah, so we talked about the Thomistic Institute a couple times already on this episode, actually a lot, because <laughs> it's doing great work. Um, so a couple of announcements or a couple of things coming up with the Thomistic Institute in person if you're looking to get on a spring retreat or something like that. So in April, April 16th to the 18th, the TI is hosting a an intellectual retreat in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, it's called Can the Mind Know God? Faith, Knowledge, and Divine Attributes. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the TI website and check that out. And then they're also hosting a retreat, another intellectual retreat here in D.C. Uh, at the beginning of May, May 7th through 9th. Um, May 9th is Mother's Day, um, especially to the gentlemen listening to this podcast. Don't forget, because men forget that it's Mother's Day. Don't forget May 9th, Mother's Day. But this retreat is on grace and peace, St. Augustine as spiritual master. So that's in May in D.C., and can the mind know God, know God in April in Scottsdale? Check those out. Um, as f While we're on the retreat train, don't forget that God's explaining that we are hosting a retreat in the summer, July 23rd through the 25th on Long Island. It's titled, As It Is in Heaven, The Christian Life. So if you're interested in that, godsplaining.org, go to our events tab. You can register, apply, and register there. It should be pretty awesome. Father Gregory, myself, will be there, as well as Father Patrick, Father Joseph Anthony, and Father who did I forget? Bonaventure. There's so many of us. <laughs> I can't keep us all straight. Uh, that's that's Dang. that. So as far as retreats, that's what we have coming up. Any other announcements, plugs, Father Gregory? No, just, just the normal stuff. So thanks for listening. Uh, please do share this episode with people whom you think might like it. So sciencey types or non-sciencey types, notice that I've covered everyone imaginable in the world. Uh, people who are kind of, you know, so-so on science. There you go. Now we got all of our bases covered. Uh, do like the podcast uh, and um, write a little review. Say like science in all caps and then exclamation point and then faith and then all caps and then exclamation point and then two thumbs up and it'll be great. Um, and then please uh, check things out on YouTube and uh, consider supporting us on Patreon. And um, there might be other things, but I always get the order wrong and I always forget something. And if I didn't, it wouldn't be tradition, so I got to stay true. So, Karin, thanks so much for having joined us. All the best in your work uh, with uh, Thomistic Institute and at Harvard. Uh, look forward, hopefully, to seeing you before too long in Washington, D.C. when you come through for a recording session, because I'm still assigned there and I have to return there at some point. Um, but... Uh, to you, the listener, our prayers are for you. Please pray for us, and we will catch you next time on God's Planning. Thanks for listening to God's Planning, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Leave a review on your podcast app, and visit us at godsplaining.org.